Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. On this episode, I have an interview coming up with Dr. Courtney Brown, a very well-known and important person inside the remote viewing community. And I'm assuming you all know the basics of remote viewing, that is this ability to be psychic in a way that the military first used for espionage purposes, but now people claim to be able to use for all sorts of reasons. Uh, you can go in the past and see what really happened in the JFK assassination or, or on 9-11, which are both projects, by the way, that Dr. Courtney Brown has carried out as part of his Farsight Institute. Or, as some claim, you can even look into the future. You can forecast Bitcoin, another thing that Dr. Courtney Brown has done. So that's what remote viewing claims do. There's many people who do it. Courtney Brown is one person who's kind of broken off from the group of military remote viewers that did this for the government. He started out with that training, but kind of taken it to a whole other level. And that's partly because his background, as you'll see, Dr. Brown is also a very respected professor in the kind of mainstream academic way at Emory University, where he really, again, has kind of pioneered some research into advanced nonlinear statistical and dynamic modeling. I say that as if I know what it means, but he's quite accomplished. He's an actor and local theater there in Atlanta and really beyond Atlanta. He's an illustrator and quite an interesting guy in a number of ways that I hope we'll break down in this upcoming interview. But before we get there, I thought I might offer a bit of a remote viewing primer, skeptico style, since I've been looking at this field for a long time and reporting on it on this show and really just trying to figure it out and reporting to you what I found. I thought I might share some clips from previous episodes and try and tie those together in a way that might set the stage for some of the questions I have for Courtney. So let me start here. It's a clip from an interview I did a couple years back with Lloyd Arbach, who is quite an interesting guy on his own, paranormal researcher, author, and in particular, an author of a book titled ESP Wars East and West. It is true that, that we got involved in this partly because of fear that, that the Russians were getting somewhere. They had been spending effectively billions of dollars uh, from the 60s onward. And, and it, there's an indication that part of how they even got involved in this, interestingly enough, is because we released intelligence that we were doing testing, which we were actually were not doing in the early 60s, that scared the Russians into spending money and going in that direction. The idea being that uh, this rumor that we would put out there to the, to the Soviets would actually get them on a path of dead end. They'd spend money and time and energy on something that, that, according to our experts, probably had no validation whatsoever. And then we start hearing things from the Soviet Union, apparently, that they were having success. So this is one part of the remote viewing story that we can hang our hat on. And that is that at the end of the day, remote viewing is really just being psychic, right? I mean, it's just doing the stuff that psychics do. Looking into the future, maybe looking into the past, maybe looking at places and things that are non-local, but that they have some ability to perceive. So if remote viewing is really about a different way of being psychic, then I think we can start to understand why government intelligence agencies, CIA, DIA, and all the IAs, intelligence agencies, why they might be interested in the ability to spy on somebody psychically. I mean, there's some awesome advantages to that, which you can immediately understand, right? One is you're not going to risk being caught, or at least you're not going to risk it as much. There's all sorts of questions about whether you could tell if someone was trying to psychically spy on you. But leaving that aside, I mean, it's completely clandestine spying. And number two, from a just logistic standpoint, it's fantastic. It's non-local. It's instantaneous. We can sit Joe McConnell down, who happens to be psychic spy number 001, but we'll get to that in a minute. And we can say, Joe, go in your psychic consciousness and view this submarine base in Russia and tell us what's going on there. 
which he did. And there's some amazing drawings of what he was able to psychically receive and give to the handlers who were asking for that information. So that part of it is what we generally understand as remote viewing. That is being psychic in a way that these intelligence agencies wanted people to be psychic. And a lot of that research is often connected to Stanford Research Institute, SRI, Hal Putoff, Russell Targ, two of the guys who are most often mentioned in connection with that research. And by the way, in case you don't know, I mean, these two guys are really, really accomplished scientists in their own fields. They're world known and and highly respected. And then their careers kind of took this other direction as they got pulled into all these crazy projects with Stanford Research Institute, which, you know, Every time I say this stuff, I kind of hesitate because I know like one tenth of the story here. And every time you talk to someone who was there and knows more about it, they give you another side of the story. For example. We were at the SRI cafeteria, you know, having having lunch and um, a big round table and Geller was across the table from me. And Keller suddenly says, I want to do an experiment with you, Jacques. So I'm going to send you... Now, this is a great story, and you'll hear the whole thing in this interview. But let me cut to the chase. So Geller instructs Valet how to do this little experiment, and it works. So they take the next step. They're right there in the SRI cafe, which kind of blows me away. I mean, they're sitting down having lunch. And they go, well... What the heck? We have some envelopes left over from the experiment we were just running. Let's use one of those, see what happens. I thought, I'm going to send it in two things. I'm going to send the the whale, which is essentially a fish. I know a whale isn't a fish, but, you know, I'm I'm going to send a fish, and I'm going to send the water jet that I see through the window. Geller said, all of a sudden, he was all business. He took his pencil, and he drew something, and he says, look, I'm going to draw what I'm getting. But I'm not getting one thing. I'm getting two things. I'm getting a fish, and then I'm getting a water jet. So he drew the two things. He didn't draw the target. There was no way he could have known that I did not send him the target. I sent him two things that I made up. And that's what he got. That's Jacques Vallée talking about his impromptu experiment with Uri Geller. Now, Uri Geller is such another interesting figure that kind of is on the side of this, but takes this story in another different direction that I thought would be interesting. And we might even ask today's guest, Dr. Courtney Brown, to comment on some of this history. But here goes. Here's the connection with Uri Geller. In episode 370 of Skeptico, you'll remember that we spoke with Greg Malazzi, who's making a documentary about Andrea Pedreich, who was loosely connected with the MK Ultra program because he was a professor at Northwestern University at the time, and they were doing all sorts of things. And one of the things he was tasked with was to find psychics. And he goes over to Israel, and he finds this amazing psychic, Uri Geller, who is known to Israeli intelligence, that is the Mossad, but nonetheless finds Geller, introduces him to the folks at Stanford Research Institute, and then they're off doing this psychic stuff. Again, remember, they're tasked with psychic spying because it's kind of a good thing, but now the connection here with MK Ultra, and it's a loose connection, folks. I'm not trying to make it more than it is, but I don't want to make it less than it is because there is this whole movement at this time to try and understand, utilize, operationalize, dare I say, weaponize extended consciousness. And it's all part of that. So Dr. Russell Targ has said, hey, we weren't doing anything with MK Ultra, And maybe he wasn't or maybe he wasn't knowingly doing it. But I think we can find those connections there. And I think that's interesting. And the other thing about that story that's interesting is we all know Jacques Vallée. We trust Jacques Vallée. He's a smart guy. If he sat there in the cafeteria and Uri Geller was able to do that, then 
that means something. And of course, we already know that Uri Geller could do all this stuff because Targ and Putoff tested him, and it's not that hard to test somebody. And if you go back and watch the videos that they've published, and we did a show on of the tests they did, you can see that, number one, the protocol for those tests is not that hard. These scientists are more than capable of carrying out those tests. So the only conclusion we can come to is that all this stuff was really happening at SRI during the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, which is, again, if you're just open-minded and fair-minded, is established fact at this point, despite what you might read on Wikipedia. But there's really another story to tell here, and that story is best teed up by yet another Skeptico clip. What happens is Wilbur Smith is running the Canadian government, and, they, and then they call the Flying Saucer Program. So he's uh, the top guy for the Department of Transport. He goes to the Americans, and he goes through there, and according to, according to what Wilbur Smith got, the file comes back, and Wilbur Smith writes this document and says, we've talked to American officials, and they have told us the following items. Flying saucers exist. It's the most highly classified subject in the United States, rated two points higher than the hydrogen bomb. It's of tremendous significance to the Americans, and there's a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. He's running the program. And then this thing, which I wouldn't realize until 2012, was the next line in the document says, and we were also told by American officials that other things might be associated with the flying saucers, such as mental phenomena. Now, the key part to that is that now we sort of know aliens are telepathic. Do you have uh, contactees, experiencers, abductees? All these people are talking about these aliens being telepathic. But in 1950, the, the first abductees would not be known until Betty and Barney Hill's came out, book came out in the mid-1960s. The first contactees who said, you know, they got for rides on flying saucers and stuff like that, would not appear until about a week after the detonation of the hydrogen bomb. Suddenly all these people appeared. But in 1950, there was nobody in the public who was saying, I'm talking to aliens and aliens are telepathic. That, of course, is UFO researcher Grant Cameron, who you may know if you've listened to this show for very long. And he's talking about, I think, this very, very important piece of history, which is the Wilbert Smith memo. And the one thing I would add to what Grant just said is that if we look at the Wilbert Smith memo in light of this larger umbrella of MK Ultra and this interest in consciousness, mind kind of stuff, which also ties into the interest in remote viewing and Uri Geller kind of stuff, and if you put that in a further context of the present day disclosure movement, where the New York Times is telling us, yes, UFOs are real. Here's the video that the Defense Department has released. If we put it in that context, it puts a little bit of a different spin on the Wilbert Smith memo, because any lingering doubts we may have had about the authenticity of that memo really have to be put aside. I mean, we are in a post-disclosure world, so how could we even imagine that that document isn't genuine? So that'll fill in some of the background of remote viewing, but it won't quite get us to the point that I want to get to in this upcoming interview with Dr. Courtney Brown. Because there's one other clip I want to play for you, and it's the bridge to the larger questions about what remote viewing means. Here's the clip. So when I started my interview, uh, what I came to find out was that they had opened a, a package that was inserted in my, uh, my 201 file, my personnel file. Uh, what had happened after my NDE is all of the all of the psychiatric reports and all of the uh, final assessments uh, as to what my experience was had been uh, put into a, a oh, permanently sure, sealed sure. file right. with a, uh, a red stripe across it, and it said not to be opened except by commander of the intelligence and security command. And uh, when they obtained my file. Uh, what they did is that was the first thing that uh, that lieutenant he was a lieutenant at the time Lieutenant Atwater opened was that was that file, and they were very pleased to find that I had had this uh, this experience in 1970 because it meant that uh, I was one of those special people that historically uh, uh, were able to probably uh, do exactly what they were looking for. 
This is an important story, an important bit of history. And it's so controversial that even Ed May, who I interviewed on this show and was running the Stargate program when Joe McConnell was there, couldn't really grok this. If you go back and listen to that very contentious interview that I had with him, he, he was in complete denial. I mean, he not only slammed Dean Radin and withdrew into this scientific materialism shell, but he even found it very hard to accept the account of his colleague, of Joe McConnell, who said this is exactly what happened. And the reason is because Joe's story really bridges us from this geeky, techie, we do remote viewing because it technically does this and that, to the challenges we have of saying anything intelligent about these extended consciousness realms. Let me explain what I mean. So Joe McConnell has the NDE and becomes psychic. How many times have you heard that story? If you've studied the near-death experience science literature at all, you know you're much more likely to be psychic after an NDE than before your NDE. Well, what's up with that? If we dig deeper and try and understand the spirituality of the near-death experience and connect that to the military intelligence aspect of we're left with the kind of questions that I guess I have for Courtney in terms of how are we to juggle these two worlds? You know, of the many amazing videos that Dr. Courtney Brown has published on his Farsight website, one of the ones that really caught my attention and made me want to dive into this show was one that didn't have all the fireworks of remote viewing Mars or the dark side of the moon or Jesus's life all targets that he's had and has provided some amazing information about through his remote viewing sessions. But the one that really caught my attention was the one about the yogis like Yogananda and other yogis who offer us a glimpse past the illusion of this time space reality we're in and might offer a clue to what remote viewing is really all about. So we're about to head off on quite an exciting journey here with Dr. Courtney Brown, and I hope you'll stay with me for it here on Skeptico. Dr. Courtney Brown, thanks for joining me. You know, I did a lengthy introduction to this interview that people will hear before they jump into this conversation, so I don't need to go over all that again. But I did want to thank you so much for joining me. I think you're such an important figure inside this, I guess I want to call it consciousness community. Your work is amazing. I think you're especially important in light of everything that's going on today. And I'm a little bit surprised when I set up this interview, I was a little bit surprised that, hey, everybody's got to be talking to this guy about this stuff. I mean, we are in the middle of disclosure. I mean, the New York Times is coming out and saying, oh, yeah, there really are UFO videos released by the Department of Defense. And then, you know, the RV original guy, Dr. Hal Putoff, is putting his name in there and saying, yes, this is all real and ET is real and UFO is real. And here you are sitting back, Dr. Courtney Brown, and this has kind of been your thing for the longest time. You're well, well well-known inside the remote viewing community, as we just talked about. But have have you given much thought to where you are right now in terms of this stuff that seems to be coming around to what you've been talking about for so many years? Yeah, it looks like it's a bit of a wave, but we've seen these waves happen before. And, uh, you know, you just have to, it's like, just don't believe it until you actually see it. So some people are coming out and saying some things, but in terms of a mass level of disclosure, I don't think that's going to happen right away. The reason is that the mass level of disclosure where governments actually say, yeah, this was going on, they don't do that unless they get something big from it. There has to be some reason for it. They're not going to just unleash that on the public. They'll keep it going as long as they can. They have to get something back from it. And right now, there's nothing they're really going to get back from it. Like if they give, if they have a, a full disclosure, you'd have to say, 
okay, well, what did the government get for that? Not just our government, but the Russian government. And like, they don't really get anything for that. The one thing you should erase from your mind permanently is that they'll do it just to be good guys. <laughs> I mean, that just won't happen. So you're getting some people come out, and but you're still not getting any articles about it in uh, the level that it needs to be talked about openly. Uh, whether that happens in 2020, I don't know. Whether it happens 2021, 22, 23, 25, I don't know. But uh, the process of making that happen is incremental. So unless we keep just, just giving the stuff out that we do, it won't ever happen. So it's, it's very important that you don't expect like a sudden wave, like a sudden immediate. There'll be an incremental movement. And what we do is part of that incremental movement. That's a good part of it. And uh, what, the, what you're seeing right now is something that's very valuable from that perspective of that incremental movement. But it's, okay. not, the, it's not the biggie that you're actually thinking about. Okay. Uh, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. And uh, Courtney, you know, I have this little kind of game that I play because it kind of helps move the conversation along and frames it up for people a little bit. I call it Skeptico Jeopardy, where I have a bunch of categories and then you get to pick. But okay, since you kind of let us in there, <laughs> I'm going to take the honor of uh, picking the first one. And, and that is, I want to talk about RV history a little bit. Because I think that what you said is really important and really significant. And I think we have to understand the past before we can understand the future. And I think what you alluded to is part of understanding that past is they ain't going to do nothing unless it's in their interest. And for one, I guess I'm very skeptical about the current round of disclosure. I, I guess let me deconstruct a couple of things you said, because they were so important and there were so many things going off in my head and I have to kind of pull it all back. One, I want to push that a little bit further because I think we've seen an unprecedented level of disclosure, never before. New York Times, the way they pushed that story out there, Fox News, CBS News, everybody coming out, the Department of Defense guy, Lou Elizondo coming out and saying, here are the videos, people. These are the videos we took on our uh, Navy uh, fighter pilots, and they are real, and UFOs are real. We've never seen anything like that. Now, the only way I think to interpret that is inside the framework you talked about, which is to immediately step back and go, hey, what are they playing here? What kind of game? And the thing that keeps coming back to me from that is Defense Department. Defense Department, Defense Department, Defense Department. I mean, if you look at this latest release, that's all they talk about. And that's very suspicious from these guys who have manipulated and controlled this information, denied this information. So one, I want to kind of push back in that, do you see this as I do as a unique wave among the waves? This is kind of a unique wave. And what might you, I want you to speculate a little bit, what do you think is the agenda? Are they trying to make ET more friendly? Are they trying to make RV, remote viewing, your field more friendly? I mean, again, Dr. Hal Putoff is right in the middle of this. So we're riding along this tail is the idea that, oh yeah, we've been denying the remote viewing stuff over the years, but there's no need to deny it anymore. This stuff is real. Do you have any thoughts on, on any of that? Yeah, it's an incremental movement. Um, it's, it's not something that's coming out and a way that's got the, like the president's not making an announcement, Congress isn't coming out with an announcement, and the Defense Department is, uh, you have to understand, the Defense Department works for the government. So they can't do things that are totally autonomous. They actually do a lot that's autonomous, but they something like that they just can't come out with. And you also have to understand that the government, in terms of the elected officials, are not very important in all of this. So... The elected officials, they are there. They get elected or re-elected every four years or two years or six years. But the real powers behind all of this are financial interests that you don't see. You, you just don't see them. And those people don't want the boat rocked. And 
in terms of the Defense Department, they're in a very delicate position because they know that politicians get voted out of office, like the presidents get voted out of office. They just cycle through. So there's really no reason to tell the president everything. Presidents have had a very difficult time getting real information about the UFO ET phenomena. And the Defense Department says, why basically should we do that? Uh, they, they're going to cycle out anyway. And it may be that they do get a file that sort of tells them a bunch of stuff so that they, the Defense Department can't be accused of you know, you know, keeping that information totally. But do they get everything? And so the Defense Department just can run out the clock with any politician. And you don't really know if you can trust a politician. They're just a political person that got a lot of votes. And do they really have a security clearance? Do they really know how to deal with things? And Defense Department people, they're there for decades. They, those are career people. And they say, basically, they're in a situation where they, can, where they can say, hey, if we wait a couple more years, the guy's gone. And okay, so, so hold, let, me, let me interject a question there, because great point. I love the run out the clock thing. Great point. But in this case, we have a, what I always see in, as an outsider is a, a political psyop related to the UFO ET thing. You have John Podesta and the Clintons who were going to use the disclosure thing, and they were open about that before the last election. And then the thing, the election turned out very surprisingly not in their favor. And it looks like now they've just gone ahead and rolled that out anyway, right? The same people behind it, the same players, and now they just pushed it out. And that's fine, but it does look to me to be completely political. You know, anyone who doesn't ask, hey, how come everyone who's pushing this latest round of disclosure seems to be just from one political side, you know, not whether that's a good side or a bad side. It's like two competing corporations, if you will. But they do seem to have some operatives inside the defense department, or maybe I have that backwards, like you're saying, maybe the defense, the defense department has them, but there do seem to be other factions involved that are not wanting to disclose or wanting to disclose a different way or wanting to I don't do do something differently. So again, I guess I'm I'm pushing that a little bit further. What about the political aspect of the current round of disclosure? What does that tell us about the relationship between the Defense Department and the the higher level secret government, if you will, and what's going on in the political scene? Well, look at um, Podesta, John Podesta, for example. He was in the administration for a long time when he was with Hillary Clinton trying to get her reelected, or her, I'm sorry, her elected. He didn't have all the information. All he promised was that he was going to try to push for it and to get some disclosure. So even when he was in the White House as, a, as someone who was working under the president, he, he didn't get it. When Barry Goldwater, a former senator from Arizona and political and, and presidential candidate, who was very much in favor of the of the government of the of the military, called up one of his friends, general friends, who he had a long tie with, and said, "Hey, just give me the scoop. What's going on?" He got this is his this is his good friend. He got the rudest shutdown he said he ever had. He said he said basically he said, "Don't you ask about this again. Period. Or you're you're done. We're not talking ever." I mean, this was a good friend of his. Just shut him out and said no. So Bill Clinton has said that he tried to push, but he didn't really get, much, get very far. So on the other hand, if you look at Russia, for example, so not President Putin, Putin but uh, his, the, the, pre the guy who was in between President Putin's uh, right, right. in office, uh, Medjev, he, he was asked about it, and he made some loose comments off the, off the cuff saying, no, when you get to be president, what they do is they give you a folder and it talks about the ED stuff and the UFO stuff and tells all about the stuff, you know, where they are and what they're doing. And he didn't say much more than that, but he mentioned there was a folder. So that may be just limited to Russia, but maybe something similar that happens in the United States. So, I mean, the, 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 the presidents don't call me and tell me, so I'm speculating. But, you know, we don't have any overt evidence that the political people 
have much information about this. So what you can say with the Defense Department is that I'm certain that there are some people in the Defense Department that really want to push this and push disclosure further, that they think it's in the, in the planet's interest. And there are others that say, no, why should we do it? And I'm positive that the economic powers that be absolutely do not want it because they're not going to get anything for it. They don't do anything. They don't do any, they may have billions and billions and billions, but they don't, they don't do ten, they don't give you ten dollars and that they get unless they get something from it. There has to be a reason for it. And I don't tell, I just don't see it. So you're seeing some leakages coming out, but it's not it's not going to turn out to be an immediate, you know, presidential announcement type thing, in my opinion. So what we're doing at Farsight is actually absolutely crucial to that. So we're not yet being talked about in the New York Times. We're not yet being talked about in CNN. I've been interviewed on CNN a couple times, but you know we're not being interviewed and talked about on those venues. So the time is not right for that. So what we're doing is we're doing all of our projects. We have a huge list of projects that we've done that we've completed, and we have a continual string of projects. We come out with at least one project a month, and we come out with um, projects that are uh, big projects, some the ones we come out with every month in a project and in a show we have called Time Cross, and the ones we come out with that are really big that we sell as movies, we have th those we come out and we sell those on Vimeo. So that's that's what we do, and then the money that we get from selling our videos, the YouTube money that we get, is about a couple hundred dollars a month, nothing nothing significant from the advertisements. The money that we get from Vimeo is a couple thousand, between two and five thousand dollars a month, depending on whether we have a, a big thing. Our payroll is twenty to thirty thousand dollars a month. So you can sort of say, where's, where's the money coming from? Well, we do forecasts. We, we do forecasts that nobody sees, economic forecasts and things like that. And that's where our money goes, that's, that's where our money comes to, to do things like that. So. We have to have a, a, you know, a different stream of income to be able to do this. But because we have a different stream of income, we can put out these projects. And so our long-term goal is to be able to make significant YouTube contributions and movie contributions, not to get into the movie theaters, but that are downloadable and that fill in the gap of everything. Because when this disclosure moment happens that you're talking about, Alex, that's when Farsight's library is going to be incredibly important. That's when the whole kit and caboodle will be, that's when the world looks at us in real time and says, what the blankety blank? And then they'll see it. So that library has to be ready. And that library is also ready for TV series and movies, things like that, of these projects. So it's not like we promise these projects. These are fully completed projects that can be filled out really quickly. So that's what we're actually doing. We're completing projects, we're setting them up. Each one is worth a television series, <laughs> at least. And some of them are worth movies. And um, as long as we can keep affording to do them, we're going to you know, do them. And so, so we have two things going on at the same time. We have economic stuff that's going on, and then we have uh, these movies going on. And we have our, and the people that work with us, our remote viewers, this is their job. This is full time. They work on it every day. They come in, they work, they get it done. So, and they've been training with us and working with us and being professionals for five years. So, and some of them are, have shorter time sprints, but some of them are really long. And that's the only way this could be done. So we knew that we had to pay people to do this, that it couldn't be done on their own budget in their free time. This couldn't be a hobby. This had to be a full time venture. So we picked people that were good on camera, usually models or, or, or actors. And we picked people that had really great presentational skills, and then we paid them. So the typical mode for training people is to have people that want to learn pay the instructor. So we reverse that, we pay the people. And so now we have a, a royal set of people and we're expanding that uh, to be able to scale up to our needs. We have way more work than we can possibly do. So we're, we're, we're having to expand. And, uh, but that's, that's what our role is, building for that moment of great disclosure that you're talking about. <laughs> Look at it this way, Alex. 
you know this Facebook thing that's going on that's got a million signatures saying they're going to storm Area 51 <laughs> in September? Well, I don't think they're going to be able to storm Area 51 to look for the extraterrestrials. But that gives you an idea of how the public is getting antsy about this subject. And so that was actually, whether there's a group of people that actually try to get into Area 51 or not, the very fact that you have over a million people signing a petition on Facebook demanding to know what's in Area 51, that's actually more important than government disclosure. That's telling you that the public is actually getting antsy about it. And when you have enough people demanding to know what's going on and they simply don't believe the authorities, that they laugh at the authorities and that the authorities start losing control, that's when it will become something that the powers that be will get something from it. They'll say, okay, now and now if we, if we let it go, we maintain control. So that thing that's going on at Facebook is actually more important than anything else that's going on. Whether there's actually people that show up on Area 51 or not, I don't think they're going to let those people into Area 51, of course. But it is interesting that the movement has started. I'm sort of interested to see how, how many people signed this, how many people signed the thing or, or you know, click on the, the thing when, by the time September rolls around. That's interesting. You just touched on so many of the points that I wanted to touch on, and, and it's great that you did. I, I really appreciate the openness, too. Um, one thing, let's jump into, I'm going to pick another category here because you just talked about it. Uh, I called it the far sight way, and the idea is you have a certain way of doing things. We have to first introduce the far sight Institute and what it is, and you just talked about that a little bit, but you might want to backtrack a little bit and talk about the structure and that this is a non-for-profit okay. organization, but you also have a for-profit organization. You've developed this thing called scientific remote viewing. We have to talk a little bit about the history of remote viewing and how this was a, a, a protocol developed by the military to be somewhat scientific so it could be repeatable and used for these espionage purposes. You, as a trained academic, as a trained really science guy, political science guy, but a science guy and understand modeling and statistics, said, wait a minute, the, the best methods to be applied here should be like this. And even in the way that you just described the way you do things, there's so many aspects of that that are embedded in your explanation, why you do things the way that you do, how you select targets, the protocol that you use, the are veers that you choose, and, and you just brush over the fact that you decided early on that, not early on, actually kind of later in the game, you decided, hey, I need to bring people in cold, train them in my technique, top to bottom, and then I need to control all these aspects of the remote viewing session, both for the quality and content of what the remote viewing session generates, but also for the presentation on video and how I'm going to present these videos. So, you know, we could spend hours and hours talking about the very impressive protocol and scientific work that you've gone into devising this thing that people see in, from the outward sense of, oh, that's Farsight Institute, that's this guy who produces these Hollywood-style productions of what they saw in the moon landing or what really happened when JFK was assassinated or what really happened on 9-11. And then they'll see this video as it plays out and they won't know all this stuff that's going on behind the scenes. So if you will elaborate a little bit on what SRV is and more about the projects, the protocols that I think people will find interesting. Yeah, well, the original stuff that came out of the military was called uh, CRV controlled remote viewing. And there were some people that had their own methods uh, that weren't CRV, uh, such as Joe McMonagle. But CRV was the one that was taught mostly to the, to the military people. And that was very interesting. It was, a, it was an interesting process. It was developed by Ingo Swan. And the military people that exist today tend to be very loyal to that approach. And that's fine. That's good. They're doing a great contribution and so on. But that's not the way we work. So we started with the CRV methods and we said, well, it's not doing everything we want to do. And there's, it's, it's just not enough. 
and we wanted to put more control. What, what do you mean when you say that it, it's not enough? Specifically, what were some of the limitations with the CRV, with the remote viewing that was done at most notably at Stanford Research Institute, and then was taken out of that, and some people did it in the private sector. But like you said, everyone just kind of, hey, this is how we learned it. This is how we teach it. This is the protocol we follow. Some amazing results people can find on the internet of people who are able to be psychic in this remote viewing way. So what were the limitations that you saw that you sought to overcome? I understand that the military people don't think that they have limitations. So I'm just speaking for myself. So the, the limitations that we had was ask and you shall receive, you know, the biblical phrase. Well, that applies to remote viewing as well. The whole idea is you don't get anything unless you ask for it. And that's called probing. You have to actually put the pen on the paper and probe for something. You have to, you have to know what you're asking for. And, you know, the, milita- the, the, the CRV process doesn't ask for much. So you're probing an ideogram and you're sort of getting whatever you get. But we have wanted a whole laundry list of stuff that we wanted the people to ask about. And the, the process also, from my point of view, was limited because it, it didn't include a mandatory phase of meditation. So when we do it, we have a mandatory phase of meditation that starts first. And then after the meditation, the viewers rest until there's no more tiredness to come out. And without speaking anything, they then calmly walk over to their desks and start their session, and they're deep. That's how we do it. And that was not a mandatory element in the military stuff. But that well, Courtney, really... let me interject something here because I don't want people to take things the wrong way. Talk about the probing thing, because I know immediately for some people who are really knowledgeable, and a lot of people listening to this show are, they're hearing remote viewing probing, and they're like, oh, He's revealing information about the target. There's information leakage going on, and that explains these amazing results. And I know that's not the case, so what do you mean by that? Well, we have, instead of, we ask for so many things, we have printed templates that they use on all of their sessions. And it's the same templates for all of their targets. So they have to go through an ideogram, the target coordinates, and then the ideogram, and that's very similar to the CRV process. And then they have to do some basic decoding of those ideograms and to, to figure out if it's hard, soft, semi-hard, semi-soft, wet or mushy, uh, is it natural, man-made, energetics, movement, uh, things like that, artificial. And then they, they go into whether it's uh, static or dynamic or whether it's complex or simple, like a and, mountain. And let me just add again, that, again, because I, I hate to kind of, you're doing such an awesome job of giving us the kind of advanced thing, but I want to make sure we don't leave people in the dust. Let me just recap for it and see if this jives so people know. When, when you design a target, your remote viewers, people who are viewing that target, let's say it's the 9-11 event, they have no knowledge whatsoever of the target that they're viewing, whether it's the life of Jesus, 9-11, or some future target on Mars. They have no idea. And then they, they receive a random number that they generate themselves. So they're totally in the dark. And they're independent. They don't talk with each other. These remote viewers come in and they do their session and they don't know anyone else who's remote viewing it. They have no idea what the target is. And it's just like a get ready, set, go thing. And then the next thing that you're adding to it is that rather than just say, okay, go on that number, you say, go on that random number that, that you took and now consider these points. And that's why some people, when they watch these videos, it sometimes seems strange the way that they talk. They say, I see an, you know, they're talking about an explosion and then they immediately start talking in another language and say, I see an event that causes this, you know, because they don't want to, it's the old CRV thing. They don't want to attach any kind of uh, overlay on it. So this is all such routine stuff for you and people who really know remote viewing, but I, I want to make sure people understand that you're way past that and you're talking about the differences in the farsight way and the way that you do it is that, you know, you're kind of structuring it a little bit more and you found that to be more effective. And then you added the meditation part, which is really interesting too. So sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure people under, don't take no, okay. some of these things the wrong way. You see, um, 
with remote viewing, you have to get the information out really quickly, like within three seconds, or the conscious mind will take over. So you have to have a constant flow of things to do. So the first thing is they draw a, they, they write these random numbers. And the random numbers don't mean anything. They're just a distraction to the conscious mind so that immediately after the random numbers are written, a spontaneous drawing can come out. And then they probe that spontaneous drawing with their pen. And in their, when they're probing it with their pen, they're feeling it with their mind, figuring out what it is. And when they do that, they have a list of things that they know they have to feel it, to feel what it, you know, to, to, to ask about. Uh, uh, ask and you shall perceive. If you just probe it, you may get something, you may not get something, but if you probe it and say, is it hard, soft, semi-hard, semi-soft, is it a structure? And then when CR, when, with CRV, the ideograms are really a very relatively small part of the actual process. What they're trying to do with the ideograms is they're trying to go through the ideograms until they have some basic contact with the target so that they can get to something called stage four. And once they're in stage four, that they're in a matrix and they start going, then they're sort of released and they go after stuff. Well, we found that the ideograms are the most important part of the entire session. So we don't want to go through them fast. We want to go through them a lot. So we have a five page single space set of things that they're supposed to ask about that they go through every time they do a session and every time they probe the ideogram. They Probe, and they probe and they ask, is it this, is it this? And they're all low-level pieces of information. So uh, they're all, it's nothing like, is it the Eiffel Tower? No. It, they're all things like, is it a hard base surface or a wet base surface? Is, it made, is there a structure on it? Is it metal? Is it hard? What does it sound like? What are the sounds that are there? And they have a huge, a huge number of you know, five pages, single space of stuff they're probing for. And they go to that ideogram to do it. And after that, they get... Um, a sketch, plus they get something called a flash sketch, which is a flash, a sketch that when they close their eyes, they have a blackboard in front of them, boom, there's an image that comes, they don't try to understand it, they just put it on the paper, and then they probe that sketch and try to fill in that sketch. Then they probe for any activity, and then they probe, and then they have any, any pictures of, the, of any, uh, sketches of the of activity. So that one ideogram leads to five pages of paper. You know, with CRV, that one ideogram is over in a page, in one page. So after we, and then we do that three times. So you're talking five pages of paper times three, you got 15 pages plus a ton of sketches. So we don't even use that so-called matrix with stage four. What we do then is we have five pages with detailed information, tons of stages, tons of uh, uh, pictures. And then we do a, a map procedure where we have them go up uh, some amount that they choose, a thousand feet, 2,000 feet, uh, they go at the at the level of whatever the ideogram was representing, then at the top of it. So if the ideogram was representing a building, the first one would be right there at the building. Then they go up to the top of the building, like a bird perched at the top of the building. And then they go, say, at 2,000 feet above it and look around. And with each one of those things, they're drawing pictures, and they're probing and figuring out what's going on. Then they go down to the base surface, and then they go one mile in one direction, one mile in another direction, one mile in the four different directions so they find out what's around the thing and then they do another set of sketches okay so and, and all of these things are in the template it's actually printed out there's so many things they have to do you can't remember them all even if you've done it a thousand times so it's a template asking you what to do so CRV uses blank pieces of paper but with us we ask so many things ask and you shall receive we made sure that they had all those things that they uh, needed to do printed on a piece of paper. So those are the big differences. Meditation, and we use templates, and we have them probe for specific items throughout the entire session. And the process, the template, and the single page, five page list of things you're supposed to look for, those are the same for all of their sessions when they're describing physical targets. So that's terrific. And for anyone who's really into RV protocol, I mean, that's just a treasure trove there. And it's hard to not understand why, other than your explanation, is people just stick with what they know, why other people wouldn't have moved in these directions, because it makes perfectly good sense. And I think when we talk about your results, you're going to prove that your results are pretty amazing using this expanded protocol. 
Yeah, but you know, we decided long ago that it's not worthwhile trying to convince anybody of anything. Just let people do whatever they want to do, and that's fine. And to get people to do what we wanted to do, we found out that it was impossible to try to persuade them. So that's why we went out and got people raw and just said, okay, we're going to teach you how to do this exactly the way we want you to do it, and we're going to pay you. Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's just kind of lay it out there. Uh, Your current RVers who are featured most prominently in your most recent videos. One, they're all African-American, and people are like, what's going on there? Two of them are these young, very attractive-looking uh, women who no, they're have all very these, attractive. Well, they're all very attractive. And then, you know, you probe a little bit further, and it's really interesting. The one African-American guy happens to your son. He's very good-looking, <laughs> but he's your son, and he lives in Thailand. And the other two, I, I just love the, the story behind that. I mean, it's not particularly politically correct, but it's like, hey, you know, I'm into well, acting. I went and found well, people who are good actors. I thought they needed to present. I thought they needed to have other skills. I wanted to give opportunities for particular groups of people, African-Americans, less opportunity. And I had a selfish reason in doing it is that because our culture is built in this way that gives them less opportunities, I'm more likely to retain them if I give them an opportunity and if they develop these skills in a way that I can utilize. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I love that explanation for why we see what we see there. Well, let me just say really bluntly that race has absolutely zero impact on what we do. Meaning, my son's out in Thailand right now trying to organize an Asian version of Farsight. And we're going to be going also out to Africa to organize an African version of Farsight. So race actually has, has no bearing whatsoever. And everybody on Farsight videos up until recently were white men. So there was, you know, no one ever brought up the issue of race then. Sure. So what, what does matter to us is youth meaning we're trying to appeal to the younger demographic that has really been the, the last element in the society to uh, be focused on the remote feeling phenomenon. So we need to, you know, the, the young shall inherit the earth. So it's very important that we appeal to the younger demographic. And we also want to work with people who are great on camera. So models are particularly good or actors are particularly good for that. And then we want to find out which people will stay with us. And so race doesn't have any impact at all on that. But I do ask, what is the likelihood of the person actually wanting to continue with us to do this? Because there's only one real currency. You can always earn more money, but there's only one real currency that you can't earn back, and that's years. So if you train somebody for a year and then they go off to business school or med school or law school, uh, or go off to you know do crop circling or whatever, then you've lost that entire year. And it doesn't matter. Money is not the issue. The issue is there's only a certain number of years you have to make a dent. So you want to work with people who are going to stay with you. So you want to have talented people. So when I uh, interviewed these people that are our current collection of remote viewers, race was never an issue. It was longevity, how long are they going to stay with us, whether they would be great on camera presenting this type of thing. We have to teach them absolutely everything. So it's not just a remote viewing. We teach them all the presentational skills and everything. And we are going to be going into making short skits like movies, but like short ones that are like three three to ten minutes long. And then we're going to go into longer series, a half hour, that are blending sort of fiction plots with real remote viewing uh, content. So imagine Star Trek but not totally fiction. Imagine Star Trek, but half real and half fiction, so that it's more entertaining to watch and it's real acting going on. But at the same time, you're always guessing, is that the real part? Is that the, is that the fiction part? So that's really the, the orientation that we have. I think that's terrific. And when I watch your videos, I do feel like, one, you, you've just advanced the bar so far. You're just to be congratulated. You're way out there in a league totally uh, of your own in terms of taking this information, taking this technique, whatever it is, even though we don't completely understand it, and kind of operationalizing it for the good, for the common good of everyone to learn stuff rather than 
weaponizing it for evil. You know, I mean, that, you're, that's where you're at. But I do feel sometimes a little bit frustrated with once I get past the reality of what you're doing, that this guy really is following these protocols, as you just described, and he's compiling this awesome amount of information that we can't really dismiss any longer. I want to go exactly where you're going, which is like, okay, I get it. It's real, Courtney. You're not faking it. Now show it to me in a way that I can really just kind of get it in a Netflix kind of story kind of way. That's where we're going, Alex. That's exactly where we are going. Well, that's exciting, man. I'm yeah, really we, looking we, forward we are, to we that. Are, we are working on that now. We need a new facility. We have two places that we do our work right now, and we need a new facility that's a little bit that's considerably larger to be able to house more than one person at a time. So if you look at all of our videos, you'll always see that there's only one person on camera. So we need to have a place that has more than one person on camera. And so working on getting such a facility at, you know, with that. And then it has to have large green screen capabilities as well. So uh, we're working on that, and that will come about. You'll also notice that we're adding new things each time. So in the last Time Cross show, you'll see that we had um, some um, short 30-second videos with a lot of stills blended together, fancy editing, introducing the viewers. So it wasn't just pop, they're there. There was a 30-second intro. And so we're trying to add things that bring sort of the backgrounds of who they are to our shows. And then we're also we're going to be doing personal vlogs that will show up on our other YouTube channel, Farsight Prime, where the reviewers talk about their lives and what they do outside of Farsight and how that sort of blends with what they do in Farsight. So, you know, that is a component of what we will do as well. And then we will start doing these skits, or these Netflix type of things that you're talking about. And um, that will bring in a much larger audience because they're fun to watch. Not everybody likes to watch video presentations on a whiteboard. Uh, some people can sort of think of that as like going to school. And we have to vary what we do in the largest possible sense in order to gain the interest of people who would like to see this content, but it has to be presented in a, in a nice way. So basically we threw out the rules that were originally developed for remote viewing as it came out of the military. And we just invented the way we would want to do this in, in real terms. And you're seeing it sort of maybe one fifth of the way through in terms of where we're actually going. And so that's sort of exciting because, you know, now there's more stuff planned. But the people that, you know, complain on our YouTube channel occasionally, doesn't happen very often, but it does, where they say, we should go back to this or go back to that. That's not going to happen. We're not going back anywhere. We're marching forward, doing new things, having interesting things to, to say and presenting things in an interesting way. There's also a, a fun factor. And we're not going to continue doing this at all unless we're enjoying ourselves. So having fun making these films is crucial. We're not working for anybody. We're working for ourselves. Remember, we get our, the, from the majority of our money from things that you don't even see. So we're not working for anybody when we do these videos. We're working for ourselves, and we want to have fun when we do these things. And a lot of fun. We want to have fun just like as if we were in Hollywood movies or we were in a TV series on you know, some sci-fi channel or something like that. So that's where we're headed, and we work with people that are going to be with us long term. Because what we do with the, the training for remote viewing alone, basic, takes nine months, and they're here all the time working on that. That's a lot of investment. And then you have to train on presentational skills, and then that goes on for a long time as well. It's a big thing. And then we have to start training on acting. We have to start training on everything. We're even, we're even teaching our remote viewers. Some of our remote viewers don't know how to swim. And we want to be able to do some video and photo shoots uh, when they're swimming. And so we're even training them on how to swim. I mean, it, it goes, you know, it's, if, if it's fun, we're going to try to do it. And uh, it will have a, a benefit for everybody because the video product will be better. So rather than hire people for expensive fees that can do everything and they'll work with you for a day or two and then ask for their money and then go, we find people that want to stay with us for a long term and pay them and 
this is their job. They don't get money from other things. This is their primary means of employment. So uh, we have to pay them enough to stay. And uh, that's what we do. And if we're not happy when we're doing it, you would see bad stuff. It, it just wouldn't be, you'd see it on the video. So if you see the videos being magnetic, interesting, and engaging, that's because they're having fun when they're doing all of this. Awesome. Courtney, where should we go next? Well, let's see. How about uh, targets? That's a good thing. Let's talk about targets then. This is mind blowing. This is where people usually start when they talk with you because it's the flashy stuff that blows people away. Hey, you want to know what happened on the secret Apollo moon missions? Go watch a Farsight video. You want to see what happened to Moses after Exodus? Go watch a Farsight video where these remote viewers have traveled back in time or forward in time and have told you and are going to tell you what would happen. So we've talked a lot about the protocol. Uh, tell us about some of your favorite targets, some of the most controversial targets that you've had, and anything else that you might think about in terms of targets, maybe upcoming well, first targets. Let me, let me tell you first how targets actually exist. Some people thought in the beginning they thought it existed because they wrote it on a piece of paper or because a computer picked it. We did a ton of research to try to figure out what causes a remote viewer to focus on one thing and not something else. And what we finally figured out, and we're, we're certain with this now, there's no ambiguity about it. We, it this, we will go to our grave saying, this is it. I don't care what anybody says. The remote viewing target is dependent upon the thoughts that the person has who is analyzing the data for the first time. So let's say you do a session now and somebody a week from now is looking at that target and comparing your data to it on a computer screen. They're looking at the target and looking at your data and so on. That's what creates the target. There is a mental telepathic link. Kind of a retro causation kind of that's thing. That's exactly right. So you're, there's a mental telepathic link because the person that's looking at the stuff that's the person that you're doing the session for. So the intent is to satisfy the informational needs of that person. So that person's looking at the target, a picture of the target. That is the thing that creates the focus that the remote viewer goes to. The remote viewer is trying to satisfy that person's informational needs. And so once you have that done, it's like a laser pointer that focuses at that one thing. So um, once we found out that we had tremendous control over the accuracy of the remote viewers. Once we realized how important that was, then we could control it. We, we understood then that we could get them to go to the right place at the right time. Every time we do a remote viewing session, the desk is cleared. Um, we don't look at anything else. We pick up the data. We first pick up the pieces of paper, but we first look at the target and we look at the computer screen, we get the touchy-feely idea of what it's like. You sort of get it into your mind and when it's there and there's nothing else, then you look at the data. And it works like a charm. If the remote viewing procedures are done correctly, they snap onto that target like a rocket. So once we did that, we said, well, we now have a, a great flexibility to do these sessions economically, meaning we can go after a lot of projects because our accuracy rate increased. And when the accuracy rate re increased, we could have projects that come out every month uh, or every, and then every few months for big projects. So we then went into a lot of things. Now, the, some of the projects were done early on with uh, remote viewers that are, that are now doing other things. We're still all friends and we all you know, we communicate together and so on. But some of the early projects were done with uh, Daz Smith out in Britain and Dick Algeyer. And they are two of the best remote viewers on the planet. They're really great. They use different procedures. They do not use Farsight procedures, but they're the best in their class in the procedures that they use. And those are the people who did the 9-11 and the JFK ones. And some of the other ones, Phoenix Lights, uh, Aliens on Iapetus, things like that. So when we did the 9-11 one, for example, and even the JFK one, um, I was the stupidest person ever. I designed the targets uh, written on a computer screen, what they were supposed to see, what they were supposed to write, what they were supposed to perceive. And I actually went... Well, again, let me interject there. Explain that a little bit because I don't want people to get the I wrong write a very, impression. I write a very explicit description 
privately. Is, this is okay. you designing the target. No one is going to see this. Oh, no one hand. ever sees. No one ever sees the target until after all the sessions are done. They're given to. They're given to me. They're scanned in. The video sessions are done. There's no more remote viewing work that needs to be done. Only then can the remote viewer see the target. Now, do you do any? You are a meditator. You really have been into TM for the longest time. It's a big part of your daily practice. Your mind hack, consciousness hack. Is that a part of what you go into when you're designing the target, visualizing the target? Do you have anything more to add about the target creation process? Well, you're it in? is. It is true that I do the TM City program. The uh, the viewers do a different. Uh, 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 somewhat similar but different form of meditation we call farsight meditation but every day i'm in meditation two and a half hours basically and uh, i'm almost in that state all the time because you spend two and a half hours every day in that state it pretty much seeps into the rest of the day as well and if i'm upset for any reason i do not touch anything dealing with remote viewing if there's any distractions, if there's some house repair that has to be done, I don't do anything because that would become part of the target. So whatever the thoughts are, I make sure that they're only thoughts relating to the target. And then I write a description of what they're supposed to be perceiving. It's very clear, that's very explicit. Uh, for example, it would be the 9-11 stuff. It would be the 9-11 the events with the Twin Towers uh, that resulted in the collapse of the Twin Towers and so on. And it would be a very explicit statement about the event, the time the event happened, and so on. And that's it. But the remote viewers don't know that. They just know that it's a project we started, and there's a target, and that's it. So they do that. And in fact, Daz Smith and Dick Algeyer, when they did the 9-11 stuff, they had no communication between themselves until the very end. And after all of the sessions were in, they were going to have a conference call between the two of them to go over what the target was. And it was in the conference call after all the sessions were done, the video, paper, everything. They had the meeting and they had an email then from me that they were allowed to open that I sent right before the conference. And that was what it was. Now, before the conference, uh, Dick Algeyer, uh, he told me he couldn't sleep for two days. He was sweating bullets because like, what if, it wasn't the 9-11 stuff. He said, this is like crazy. That's all I saw. He said if he was wrong and the target was something else, he was going to have to quit remote viewing. It was <laughs> crazy. And apparently, I was told that uh, Dad Smith had sweat beating up on his forehead when they were getting ready to open the, t the email that told them the target, meaning they didn't know. And finally, when they saw the 9-11 events was the 9-11 events, it was like apparently a huge moment of release. <laughs> of relief when they did it. That's the true of all of our stuff because no one really knows what the target is till it's all done and then you sort of wonder if you're gonna if you're gonna have to quit remote viewing if they're all washed up or whatever. And so they did that. Now that the nine eleven events and the JFK were one of our premium projects that we sold on Vimeo for a number of years. But we've gotten to the point where we wanted some of those things to be out just for the historical reference. So the nine eleven events and the JFK ones we finally put out for free on YouTube for people to watch. We do not monetize them, so we earn no money from that. Uh, we stopped earning money from it from the sale of videos on Vimeo. So, but we thought it, I just felt it was necessary for the public record for the stuff to be out there for whatever for whatever reason. Just let it be. And but the other ones, most of the other ones, we for our major projects, we have a lot of free projects. But we also have the premium projects, and so a lot of those, like the War in Heaven and Moses Beyond Exodus, uh, those are for sale on Vimeo. And they help, uh, when people buy those ones, that really helps us to make the next one. Great, Courtney. Okay, where shall we go next? Well, you have E.T. on your screen. You want to do that? Sure, you are... sure. You're the, you're the guy. Well, it's up to you. It's up to you. <laughs> we actually already covered money, we covered targets, we covered the Farsight way, and a little bit of RV history. So uh, ET is a, it's a good way to, to round it up. ET, let's talk when, about When it. people think of Farsight, they often think of, you know, extraterrestrial, because we have done a number of extraterrestrial-related, UFO-related projects. And that's sort of fun. You know, we're way beyond the point of wondering whether UFOs and aliens exist. So... 
since we've done so many targets, so many projects with ET UFO content, we just we, we just know that they exist. And so we just sort of say, well, let's find out what they're doing. What's the whole story behind them? Well, and you know, that in it. itself is interesting. Again, in light of the current, you want to call it a wave of disclosure, but inside the current wave of disclosure, because you were out there and everyone else is catching up. So before, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, to talk about ET UFO as directly as you did, just like this is a reality that we face every day through the information we're getting back. And to talk about it so matter-of-factly back then is astounding. Because to talk about it now isn't as astounding. It's just much more mainstream. So that's it. But I want to really, when I think of ET and I think about having the opportunity to talk to you, Dr. Courtney Brown, I jump to the kind of level three discussion, which is what is ET's role in these extended consciousness realms? What have you found? Is there a cosmic hierarchy? ETs, angels, demons, gods, how does all this stuff fit together? Is there an agenda? This is something you've talked about off and on, bits and pieces, but pull it all together. Are there multiple agendas, as many people have speculated? So beyond the reality of ET, what's the inside story of what's going on? It's there? very simple. It's the old biblical thing again. As above, so below. There are so many groups and they do all their different stuff. It's, they, it's just like us down here. And they all have their special interests or private interests. They have groups that they group together. It's just like we have United Nations. I mean, it's, it's, they have as above, so below. And in terms of confusion, just like there's confusion down below, there's confusion up above. So uh, if you want to know what the ETs are like, just look at the planet Earth. That's what they're like. Uh, there's all types of groups and all types of things going on. Now, they all have their own special interests. There are some groups that want to just be altruistic and help humanity and so on like that. Other groups have their own special interests uh, for themselves and that they're pursuing their own stuff. So what we found is that it's very difficult, impossible, it's just not worth it to try to convince everybody that there are ATs. So what we found is that many groups, even in the paranormal community, they simply don't want to talk about extraterrestrials the way we talk about them. And they want instead to hedge their discussions so that they sound scientific, so that they sound like they're making very marginal statements that are just a little bit off of what mainstream science says. So they surround it with a lot of statistics. They surround it with, and mind you, I don't mind statistics. I teach statistics at a university. That's what I do for a living. It's not mathematical models. That's what I do for a living. So I'm not opposed to math or statistics, but uh, these, there's a lot of people in the paranormal field who, who fill their discussions with very scientific sounding text that almost nobody reads and very large quantities of numbers. And the contributions are marginal, in my opinion. So they are afraid of talking about just UFOs, ATs, extraterrestrials. For example, you can see a paper that published, that's published in a journal that talks about uh, the study of a UFO photograph. And they look at the light as it was diffracted and the different angles under certain things. They're examining the light. Could the light mean something this way or that way? and they look at the different lensing of the light. For heaven's sakes, it's a, it's, a, it's a craft, and like, who's in the craft, and like, where's it going, and what's happening? And they're talking about the light this way and that way. And at the end of the article, you don't even realize that they're talking about a spaceship. Well, I so, think we I mean, can take that one step further, right into the ET realm, you know, and we've had a discussion more frequently on this show about the work of the Free Institute, Ray Hernandez, and that group who's gone out and did, fortunately, great. again, I'm all for statistics. I'm all for the proper application of the scientific method. And what uh, Ray's group has done is the first academic scientific study of ET contact experience. And what falls out of that, again, is a lot of statistics 
66% of people found the ET contact positive healings, this number of percent, you know, da, 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 da. But the reason I bring it up is for your point. I, again, I think we can even get lost in those statistics. He's done an important job in moving us away from the evil alien thing. But what is the real story behind the numbers? And what yeah, I've well, been interested in doing is juxtaposing that with a similar set of numbers and data we get back from the near-death experience phenomenon. And that's the, you know, what are those, what do those numbers look like? And yeah. the, all that, I want to roll that all into one big question, because the question I've been asking people lately, and it's kind of tongue in cheek, but not really is, does ET have a near death experience? Does ET have a life review and see the, the being of God in the hierarchy of uh, the supreme consciousness as That's above, good. so below? Uh, is there is there something is there a hierarchical structure beyond the planetary kind of UN council? Is there a spiritual hierarchical structure to the world realm that ET is in? Yeah, well, actually, I'm aware of that. Or of that, uh, uh, actually, is a big book now. Uh, that research that you just referred to, and that's a little different because they're talking about uh, experiencers, people who have reported that they have gone through an, adult, an abduction experience or a contact experience, and they're, and they're talking about statistics related to how those people experience that. And that's different from what I was talking about. That's actually a very useful application of statistics, and I, that research is actually very interesting. But the other people that are doing stuff on a, a you know, sort of a oh, uh, more marginal level that's heavily couched in scientific language, jargon, and numbers, their stuff is very important and very interesting, but it's limited in its scope. And they are very, mm, I hate to say it, but uh, they're very much afraid, in, in my view, to, to publish anything that's really sort of further beyond that type of framework that they work within for fear that, the mainstream, that they'll be giving up their chance for the mainstream scientific community to accept them. So my view is that the mainstream scientific community isn't worth fighting for in the first place. And the mainstream scientific community is not going to accept, is not going to accept them no matter how, how they write their papers and no matter how they couch their, their data and statistics. Sometimes an article comes out, Daryl Bem, for example, has done some really amazing stuff and he's got his articles sometimes published in very mainstream uh, psychology journals, which is very surprising, very interesting. And, and he's sort of an exception that he's got some stuff that's really out there, but is very interesting at the same time. Dean Radin has also done some really interesting stuff that's got published in good venues. But the, the bulk of the stuff that is out there has a very marginal scope. It doesn't go beyond the boundaries. And so I'm not criticizing it. I'm really not criticizing it. I'm really glad it's there. If it wasn't there, someone would have to do it. It's just that it's not what we want to do. We don't want to live within those boundaries. We want to find out the larger questions. So those people tend to minimize our contribution. Although we do not minimize their contribution, it's actually necessary to do. It's just not the way we want to do it. If remote viewing actually works, for heaven's sakes, pay people to learn it, train them for years and years, get them to be good at it, and then look to see what they find out. And then put the projects up. And then build a video library with those projects, and then build, Netflix, as you said, Netflix-type things that sort of bring it to life. And let it just change the consciousness of the planet just by its existence. So that has a role, too, in what it is. So it's, n it's not that the people who couch their stuff in limited... Uh, scope, but very scientific wording is got a problem. They're, they don't have a problem. They just have borders around what they do, and that's okay. That's that's good. That well, it's, it's not necessarily but okay, it, and, and I understand the distinction. No, that it is okay now. because it's, it's the way they want to make their contribution. It's well, just not good enough for what the planet needs right now. The planet needs a, a, a wider spectrum of stuff, and so we have a different approach to it, and they have their own approach to it. In combination, it'll work out, it'll work out fine. Well, you have a different approach to it, 
amen to that and fantastic so glad as you just summarized that you're out there doing it you know, the, now if, the, we did, if we had our approach only and they didn't exist that would be a problem yeah so that, I, I get what you're saying but we, we have to factor into that the the angle that not all of that is what we see i mean some of those shenanigans that materialistic consciousness is an illusion oh this can't possibly be part of that is a social engineering project too right because your whole history of remote viewing suggests that or the, the history of remote viewing suggests that hey people in the government whatever that means government they knew that these extended consciousness realms existed 50 years ago. So they let academia kind of putter along and spit out this nonsense is that there's no such thing as consciousness and don't look there and ESP is a joke, ha ha ha. And, uh, you know, entheogens, that's not really happening, all that. So they perpetuated that. And we can say, oh, well, gosh darn, they were just so dumb and stupid. Or we can say they were propped up to kind of tell a particular story in the same way that disclosure 50 years ago was not what it is today. And it was a different message about, oh, anyone who says that is tinfoil haddish and stuff like that. So when we see how the message changes, we can say, oh, gosh, we're the ones out there who made it happen. Or we can say this is all part of a social engineering project. So what I was really doing was jumping two steps beyond that. Great. So there's mainstream academia, and they let Daryl Bem get out there and do a couple papers, but we've reviewed that extensively on this show, and that the blowback from Daryl Bem was also, you know, something that most people can't endure either, so the message is sent, you don't really want to go there if you're an academic, but I, I do have to kind of push back on one thing, is that Ray Hernandez, love, good friend of the show, support him, and support his work financially the best I can, but he's running into the same traps here. When you start publishing uh, you know, these large surveys, just like they've done in NDE and say, 66% of people say this about contact experience. Therefore, we can conclude that ET is this. No, I don't agree. I agree with what you said, which is as above, so below. We have to look at this from a much more broader spiritual perspective. We have to look at the yogis. We have to, one, understand that we don't understand anything outside of this time-space reality, and we're just trying to probe around and admit the limits of our knowledge. So I, I think there's a lot there that, that we still need to learn. I know you don't disagree with that, but I do want to bring it back around. If you want to comment on any of that, you could. But I want to bring it back to this question of the larger spiritual aspect to this, and not as a spiritual uh, kind of practitioner, but as a kind of spiritual scientist, if you will. Is there a spiritual hierarchy that is outside of the materialistic hierarchy. So in this country, we have a hierarchy that we can all see and we have an economic hierarchy and the billionaires and the one percenters and people above that. But then when we move over to the spiritual realm, we say, well, that doesn't really even matter. They're playing a different game and whatever spiritual truth there is, isn't interested in that game. And their NDE ears, when people have a near-death experience, then they're woken up to this other reality where all that stuff doesn't matter. So the question is, where is E.T. on these materialistic consciousness hierarchy versus spiritual yogic Jesus hierarchy? Well, um, my personal view on that after doing all the studies that we've done and marching forward into the future with new studies is that there is no such thing as a spiritual anything. There is just life. And there's physics for why we can't see certain life and why we can see other life. But since the remote viewing phenomenon works and you can perceive across time and space and with apparently no time or limitations in, in distance, obviously our consciousness extends beyond the physical body. So one thing we're absolutely certain about is that the physical body is just a thing. It's just a physical thing. It's like a car. And it's okay to buff it up, put makeup on. It's okay to do whatever you want with it, work out, build up the muscles. You're just messing with a car. It's like taking your car and getting a new paint job. So it's just a thing. And you have to have that thing in order to 
operate in this realm, just like you have to have a car in order to drive on the road. So when people die, they pop out of the body, and then they are the way they were before they had the body. And they see different things because of the physics of the nature of what it, you know, of, 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 that, of that side of things. But to say something like there's a spiritual thing, that's sort of putting a woo-woo factor on just some aspect of life. There's physics involved in why we have our physical stuff, and there's physics involved in why we have our non-physical stuff. ETs have then an ability to travel and blink in and out of what we call our physical reality in the sense of you see a ship, it'll be flying through the atmosphere at great speed, and then suddenly it's off radar and no one can see it. Blink, it's gone, and then it appears, you know, 20 miles down, and it suddenly reappears. <laughs> so what they do when they do that, just like you pop out of your body and you can't see, the physical person can't see the, you know, the, the non-physical person anymore, they have technology that, well, I don't want to get too much into the physics, but technology that sort of changes the vibration of the ship, surrounds it with a quantum signature that's a bit different from what it was before, and suddenly we can't see it anymore. And radar won't pick it up anymore. The physical reflections of light doesn't happen, so we can't see it anymore. And they have technology that they can still see us. So when you talk about the spiritual realm, you're really just talking about beings or people or subjects or whatever. And when you talk about religions, what you're talking about is stuff that's happened with beings, people, subjects, things that have evolved into being religious constructs that we have today. But there's nothing but people, subjects, and everything. So what you have is when you have Moses beyond Exodus and amazing things seem to happen, well, some group made those amazing things happen. And humans had to compartmentalize it to make it sort of understandable, so God did it. And there's just beings out there, and they have stuff that they do. And some of them like to get involved with us, and they think if they tweak us this way or tweak us that way, the civilization will evolve in a better way, this way or that way. And we put names on those beings and say, this is a god, that is so-and-so. So, um, that's what there is. Hold on, because there's so much to process there, and this is right in my swing zone. So I guess the first question I'd ask is the question I ask all uh, skeptics and atheists is that, is there any meaning to any of this? Is there any meaning to the universe? Yeah. Uh, one thing I've concluded for certain is that there is a larger being that some people may want to call God, but there is something, a larger being. You might want to call it a different name. Uh, some people call it all that is, meaning it's whatever it is. It's everything that exists. And there is no such thing as a God that's separate from you. What basically it is, is everything that exists in the universe, from a rock to a computer monitor to a person to an inchworm, everything is alive. Absolutely everything. There's nothing that's not alive. It's all the same phenomenon of waveforms that interact. And these waveforms produce amalgams of things that sort of congeal together that we see as people and subjects and things. Okay, but, there is a God. Is there well, let, me, let me explain. Let me explain. Is there a moral imperative? Is there a right but, and wrong? We don't know. What we do know <laughs> is that there is nothing but energy in the universe. There's no such thing as matter, and there's probably no such thing as distance. That goes against mainstream physics, I know. But physicists have never, ever, ever, ever found anything solid. If you look at your desk, you say, that's solid, my body looks solid, but it's not. It's just empty space and molecules. You go into the molecules, it's empty space and atoms. You go into the atoms, you get empty space and subatomic particles. You go into the subatomic particles, you get empty space, and it goes down the rabbit hole. They've never found anything that's a solid thing. They just find energy and these particles. And the particles are energy manifestations. They come out of wave packets. It's the complicated physics stuff. There's nothing in the entire universe except energy. E equals mc squared. Energy equals a scalar multiple of mass. And mass and energy are the same. They're just different versions of the same thing. So what we have throughout the entire universe is energy. And that includes us, 
and what you might want to call our souls. There's nothing existing anywhere in our universe that isn't energy. And so what happens is you can say, well, then if energy is everything, then we're thinking and everything's sort of coming out of energy. So it turns out that, in fact, there is such a thing as a larger being that's composed of all of this energy. And this larger being, from the best we can figure it out, I'm speculating, but from the best that we can figure out, this larger being wanted to know what it felt like to be us. <laughs> it, it wanted to know what it felt like to live almost an infinite variety of different experiences. And so it broke itself up into little pieces. And the pieces interact. And they're called Alex and Courtney. And they're called other things. And they're called Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And, <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. And so these pieces interact among themselves. So is there a God? Uh, well, there is a larger being that's alive because we're alive. Is there so, a being beyond the larger being? Yeah, if you, if you say, Courtney, is it possible to speak to God? I'd say, absolutely, I'm doing that right now, Alex, it's you. And you're talking to me. We're all part of that larger thing. And so everything that's inanimate, like a chair or something like that, is also part of that same energy. And on some level that we don't understand, everything somehow exists as a living thing. I, we, and I don't know how a, don't ask me to explain the consciousness of a desk. I mean, I don't know, I don't understand all of that, but it's all part of the same thing. And so what we have here is a larger being that we can call all that is. And now the real question is, what is the game plan for this all that is? That's it's, one of the questions, but I want to keep, I want to keep bringing you back. You're the science guy. You love science. I love science. We just haven't been allowed to probe science because they keep us spinning on all this stupid stuff that is pseudoscience. So I take the over 200 peer-reviewed studies in the near-death experience science as being significant and important, just like I take the contact experience science and the work that they've done as important. And I try and merge the two and understand the two. And I guess I just can't step past all that near-death experience science. One, because we understand the physiology there of particularly people who've had a cardiac arrest and then have a near-death experience. So their heart is stopped, which means that the brain is not functioning in the way that would normally produce consciousness, and yet they're having these experiences in the extended consciousness realm. Now, for you, you might say, no big deal. We've probed the extended consciousness realms without the brain, without the body. We get that that exists. But I take that and say, okay, then what do we understand about the content of those experiences? And what they're telling us consistently over and over again, and I interviewed Dr. Jeff Long, radiation oncologist, compiled the largest database, over 3,000 near-death experiences, wrote a New York Times bestselling book. And he says, Alex, they're talking about God. And he goes, this is underreported because people don't want to deal with it or can't deal with it or it doesn't fit into their paradigm. Or like you said, it's not academically acceptable. But this is the overwhelming experience people have. More than saying the tunnel or more than saying, you know, all these other things. It's God. It's the experience of a higher being that they understand and associate and understand in this kind of I understand everything way, right? So in these realms, then it's like, boom, download of information. I know everything. I know there's a God. I know there's a hierarchy of beings. I know there are great beings, which you talk about in some of your videos. You know, great beings, the yogis, the masters, the mystics, the Christian mystics, or whatever religion mystics. These are great beings that seem to be on some kind of spiritual hierarchy. They always talk about a, a moral imperative. There is a right and wrong. You will judge yourself based on your deeds, and you will know, as you know down here, you know what's right and wrong. And up there, you will know what's right and wrong. And this is not a religious kind of thing because there's not some big mean God on a cloud who's judging you. It is a soul journey, you judging yourself kind of stuff. But this data to me, and I call it data because that's what it is, it seems to be an inescapable part of what we're talking about. So I got to push you there. Uh, the, the blob of consciousness thing, it's all just life. I think we know more than that at this point, but I'm not sure you quite agree with me. Well, this is a good point to wrap up the interview with because uh, it, it, it tells you where we don't know things. So Alex, let me end the interview by saying we don't know the answers to that. 
and that there are other people that have their views of what they think is going on and they may be right and they may be wrong but we're going to keep on plodding along with what we do at Farsight until we fill in as many of the blanks as possible but the questions that you just asked are the ultimate questions so in terms of my own interest I'm sort of wondering why this being that's all it is broke itself up into pieces and like what is the game plan what is the ultimate thing and I'm interested if that being ever found another being like itself and I'm interested in knowing if it broke itself up into pieces because it experienced pain I mean we just don't know the answers to these things and the answers to the questions that you just raised are just as interesting and that's why it's so interesting to have so many people raise these questions and write these valuable books about this subject um, we don't know and there's more that we don't know than we do know awesome well again folks our guest has been dr courtney brown you'll find his just incredible work at the farsight institute please do watch his videos so many of them are now available for free that he used to sell buy the ones that he sells as well because as he said it's not the major part of his income but it does help if you're interested in the protocol and the science of this pick up his book remote viewing uh the science and theory of non-physical perception it'll answer a lot of those kind of background questions dr brown it has been an absolute delight having you on and i appreciate you willing to go for all these different areas that we took you in Best of luck with all your work, and thanks again so much for joining me. Alex, it's been a great pleasure. It's a very interesting interview, and I had fun, I had fun doing it. One last thing, the website, for those who want to know, is farsight, F-A-R-S-I-G-H-T dot org, O-R-G. Alex, it's been great. Thanks so much. Thanks again to Courtney Brown for joining me today on Skeptico. I guess I'd tee up one question from this interview, and it's really the only question. Do you think remote viewing is real? I mean, all the, the best evidence we have suggests that it is. Every way we've looked at it, and you can go look at the science, suggests that something is happening. But it's just hard to fully embrace that we can really look into the past, let alone look into the future, which is really seems strange to me. I think there's something there. I'm just not always 100% sure of the information we're getting back and the filters that are being applied and the overlays that are being applied. Not consciously, but just, uh, I just have my questions. How about you? What do you think? Love to hear your thoughts. Comment here if you're on YouTube, jump over to the Skeptico Forum where I like to hang out and talk to people, but let me know your thoughts. Let me know if you enjoyed the show, who you'd like to see on the show. Be warned that I'll probably ask you to invite that person on the show, but that notwithstanding, please do connect, interact. I always say that. I, I just love to hear from people and hear what you think of this little Skeptico journey that I'm on. Be sure to check out the website, Skeptico.com. I have over 400 interviews there, a lot more than, in, than on YouTube. I'm just kind of new to YouTube, but I'd like to get more involved with YouTube. I'd like to connect with more people on YouTube. So that's definitely out there. If you have any suggestions or ideas, do let me know. Many interviews coming up. Stick around for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now.